is do anyone want coffee? Or what they're doing? A show of hands, if we make coffee, would you want coffee? Okay, we won't make it then. Good evening. I want to thank you for coming tonight. And we had such a, we looks like we have so many of you wonderful faces. I want to thank you for praying for me. Um, I'm telling you, you prayed me in um, and back to Bible study. I was very, very sick. And it's been so, it's so wonderful to be here uh, tonight with all of you. And what a blessing it is. I want to thank you for your prayers. I want to thank you for your texts. I want to thank you for your um, emails. I want to thank you for your, um, some of you for your sweet visits. Um, it is because of that that I am standing before you today. I'm upright today. <laughs> so um, thank you, thank you. Just a few announcements this evening. Um, please take some donuts. Um, feel free um, to go over there. They're for you all. Um, in uh, not in counting this week on the 16th is our first poinia. It is based on the book of Acts. For those of you that are new uh, to Bible study, where they gathered as groups and they broke bread and um, gathered together and um, shared um, in the love of Jesus. And we do that here in women's Bible study. And we are blessed to have two wonderful speakers. And um, so you are going to in for a special treat on the 16th. Um, our theme is going to be um, appetizers and desserts. We'll have a sign up for you after Bible study. So you can sign up if you'd like to bring an appetizer and a dessert um, uh, on the 16th. But come, there is no lesson on that day. It's just a time to um, partake and join in as uh, women, you'll be able to share in your groups and you'll get to be blessed by the speakers that'll um, be here in a time of special music that evening. Um, in addition um, to that, we have a special teacher um, tonight and you're in for a wonderful, wonderful treat um, this evening. And uh, her name is Veronica Ramsey. Those of you who um, are here in um, True Light who know her as one of our counselors. And um, if you um, are here and um, you are in the church and you would like counseling as women or one-on-one uh, -on -one or as a family or um, individually, um, Veronica is wonderful. She has a true um, uh, Jesus heart and she loves the Lord. Um, she's been following Jesus since the age of 14. She um, is seeking to apply her spiritual gifts and God uh, given talents in counseling and in missions by speaking the life um, to people and sharing for living hope in Jesus to people. Can you think of any greater gift than speaking back um, just the love of Jesus into people's lives? She's been married to Stacy for 20 years. She has four kids and she homeschools. So those of you that are homeschoolers can relate to her heart. Um, one is now in college and professional. Uh, she's a professional counselor, like I shared here in True Life. Um, she feels um, most um, at home in the outdoors. So those of you that are outdoorsmen or outdoor women, um, then you would uh, relate to her heart. So today she's taken this lesson. She's um, been sitting at the feet of Jesus and she's going to share from the heart. So um, I'd like us to pray for her and pray for our time together. So will you just bow your heads with me and let's pray and then welcome her. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time together. We, um, we love you, Lord, and it's because we love you um, that we are here and we are gathering, Lord, in your name. And we're here to follow you, Jesus, because we love you so much. And we thank you for um, our time in your word. And Father, we want to hear from you tonight. And we just thank you, Father, that Veronica is here, Lord. And we want to hear from you, Father. So Lord, open our hearts, open our ears. Lord, and speak to us, Father, from uh, your word, from this time of teaching. And Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would use Veronica to stir in our hearts, Lord, that which you desire to do in our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us, um, would you give us a warm welcome to Veronica? <laughs> 
Thank you, thank you. Well, the, uh, the section of Mark that my lessons kind of were over was chapter 6, 45. Chapter 6, verse 45 through chapter 9, verse 13. And talk about the inexhaustible word of God. There is so much in that range of chapters and verses. And I chased a lot of rabbits. And I, I don't know if I caught any of them. <laughs> but um, yeah, just, you know, one thing will lead you to back to the Old Testament or, or over here with the, the parallel account and another gospel. And, uh, so it was uh, definitely uh, an, an attention deficit adventure for me. <laughs> but I hope to just kind of share with you some of the things that left off the pages as I looked and studied. Go from there. And, and I think, you know, more importantly, it, just to say as a kind of overarching message, it matters what we do with God's word and it matters what we do with Jesus as far as the place he has in our lives or even just the way we approach him and think about him, it, it matters. And so I just kept feeling drawn to the, the one particular portion on the, I'm going to say Syrophoenician. I've heard people say Syrophoenician, but the region is from Syria. So <laughs> I'm going to say uh, Syrophoenician woman. I just felt towed back to that. It's vast of the amount of material that's here. That's just where I kept returning to. And just kind of um, then even later came to just see her in contrast to some of the things that are happening with the Pharisees and scribes. And so mostly uh, we'll be kind of camping in chapter seven. Of that. And so, you know, up, up to that point in um, probably the end of what you guys covered last week, so Jesus has fed the crowd 5,000 and he's walked on water before the, the fortune that I'll be going over. And, and the, the word tells us that the disciples hadn't gained much insight. They hadn't really taken from that account of feeding the 5,000 and applied it and that their hearts were even hardened. Verse uh, 52 of chapter 6 says, so you know, liter literally and figuratively in that um, time of, of the wind, the, the conditions just distorted their view of him and, and who he is. And so they're still just not understanding. And, you know, maybe someone even referred to as it's unbelief. But the wind understood him. Uh, discount. And, and so it seems that the disciples, that maybe that there's just still some level at which they don't want to submit to Jesus' lordship and, and surrender to him at, at the very core, which is the heart. You know, but that's what we're taught, right? We're taught, don't surrender. In athletics or, or maybe even military pursuits. We're taught that um, surrendering is, is bad. You don't, you don't do it. You, that's giving up. That's losing. You know, we, we can only do it when we are uh, just depleted. We don't have enough of the tank to keep going. We don't have anything left in us. You know, but maybe if we can shift our thinking into that surrender can be good, a good connotation, not, not just a negative. And so looking at the, the first section is going to be in chapter seven, starting with verse one. Um, a lot of Bibles will labor at something like followers of tradition. And so I'm just going to read to you for the verses. So Mark chapter 7, verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. And so bread is a very prominent theme in this portion of Mark. That it's the word bread or loaves happens about 20 times in Mark. And nearly 18 of them happen just in chapter 6 to 8. So there's something, you know, very uh, much that we're supposed to take from just what Jesus is saying about bread in these chapters. 
For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they are carefully washed their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So they care more about what men say than what God says. And they're teaching traditions of man as if they were God. And then in verse 8, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. So they're they're not listening to God's word, they're ignoring it. In verse 9, he was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you, it's Corbin, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. So here it's in particular the fifth commandment that's being referenced about honoring your father and mother. They're, uh, again, abandoning, rejecting, setting aside God's word. And yes, sometimes God's word has inconvenient, uh, <laughs> uncomfortable truths and commands for us. Um, and, and they're trying to get out of those things, trying to get out of some of the even maybe uh, fiery consequences uh, of doing so. And at the same time, trying to act pious as if, what they're doing in place of it is somehow, you know, even more strenuous or, or a greater uh, command that takes uh, even greater commitment from them. And so at, at the same time, they're trying to, uh, you know, say that we have more demanding practices than God does. <laughs> and so that's elevating even themselves above God and his word. And the issue about Corbin and is that, you know, that's basically, they would say, um, you know, everything that we have is Corbin. And so essentially an, an offering to God. And so therefore, like saying, we can't take care of you, mom, dad, because everything that we have is Corbin. Sorry, it's, it's dedicated to the Lord. It's an offering to him and too bad. <laughs> um, you know, so they're kind of using God's, uh, they're, they're ignoring God's commandment and, and just not even wanting to honor their parents. Let's see. So, I can't remember if I've read verse 13. The, in verse 13, it says, Thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. And by doing so, they're, they're blunting God's word. They're trying, they're making it null and void and, and empty. By, you know, saying that, no, it's not that. It, it's the things that, that we do, our traditions and the rituals and ceremonies that we carry out. You know, they're saying that it's, um, you know, it, it's the external things that matter. And Jesus is, you know, going to be putting out to them, no, oh, it's the internal, it's the heart. That that is the very matter of what uh, needs to change. You can wash as many times <laughs> as you want to. You can wear a specific <laughs> style of clothes or length of robe. You can do all of those things, but it doesn't change the real issue. It doesn't change the heart. And you know, it's you know, God's word made flesh in Jesus. That, that's the person work of Jesus that is what and who transforms. And so, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people that are okay with the Bible as far as they handle God's word. They um, they say the Bible's fine. And um, you know, they, they may even say I accept the Bible, but then they might have the addition of, but that it can only be understood with these additional books. You know, 
with um, another type of reference, with the Book of Mormon, with the Jehovah Witness Watchtower, you know, you know, with some sort of publication, and, and in doing so, they they too make the Bible just null and void. They're without power. You know, is, is what they're saying about it, but they can't make it null and void. But it's what they're saying when they're doing that. And so through this encounter with the Pharisees, we're beginning to see Jesus take down the wall between Jew and Gentile. It, it is coming down, and he's also talking about, you know, that the heart of man, it's not the external things that, that need changing. It's, it's the internal, it's the heart. And it's the things that proceed out of the heart that defile. And so then come to take a look at the woman who's mentioned uh, in chapter 7 and starting in verse 24. So Tyre is a, a place that was located in what is now Lebanon. And so when you're hearing kind of in the news the uh, things that are going on between Hezbollah and Israel, you know, that contempt goes all the way back to biblical times. And Tyre and Sidon are uh, two coastal cities on the Mediterranean, and they weren't uh, really known for their faith. Um, though Matthew, and Matthew does said, woe to you, uh, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago and sat cloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. So there's some receptivity to God and his word in those areas. They also weren't known for their cleanliness. All the list of things that Jesus had just finished a discourse on that are the things that, uh, that come from within that render something unclean, or render a person's heart unclean. So he's just saying that, um, you know, he has come intentionally to that place. You know, it doesn't matter that that is what maybe they're known about, what they're known for, you know, clean or unclean. He intentionally leaves and goes specifically to this region for a purpose. And earlier in the book of Mark in chapter 3, verse 7, it tells us that people from this region, they knew about Jesus. They were present in Capernaum and word had spread, even though that's about 50 miles apart, uh, Capernaum and, and the region of Tyre and Sidon. So people had heard, they had traveled, they had uh, known of Jesus, they had heard of who he is and, and the miracles he had performed. I'm going to start in verse 24. Chapter, again, chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And then Matthew says also in Sidon, in his account. And when he had entered a house, he wanted to know a bit. Or he wanted no one to know of it, sorry. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. And she, from that spot, she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So again, mention of an unclean spirit. So we're still in kind of that theme of clean, unclean. And, you know, the Pharisees weren't willing to pay any type of due respect or homage to, to Jesus. But here is this woman who uh, deemed a pagan you know, of the, the, the line of Canaanites falling at his feet. And she's got many conditions against her as far as situationally in her circumstances. Number one, she's a woman in that day and time, and the scripture doesn't say anything about a husband or a father to her little child coming with her, being present with her. So you know, who knows what that part of her life story is. There's no mention of it. You know, she's a Gentile, so she's considered culturally unclean in the eyes of the Jews. Uh, and then Matthew's account tells us she's a Canaanite, which, you know, is one of the uh, the curse lines, you know, back in the Old Testament that, you know, the, the God 
commanded that Joshua and the Israelites stamp out. Um, but there, you know, there's a remnant. A rem there's a remaining um, number of Canaanites, and and they are very much involved in pagan worship. It's kind of the center of Baal worship. So she's, you know, got that kind of mark against her as far as what how people would view her. Well, she's just considered ethnically unclean as a non-Jew. She has the, the demonic attacking her daughter. And then so just by association, she's considered unclean because her daughter is battling an unclean spirit. And in Matthew's account, the disciples are wanting to send her away. You know, she's got the disciples wanting to send her away. They're saying, uh, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. And so they're just you know, wanting her to hush. And then in reading the text, it, it even says in Matthew that um, he did not answer her or at first. And so there have been a lot of sermons done, a lot of messages given that somehow um, Jesus is being harsh to her. And you know, Jesus knows the fullness of her. He knows her heart. He knows her faith. He knows her, her condition and her doubts. But one thing that, to be very clear just about Jesus, is he would not contradict what God's word says about him. He would not, you know, go against, you know, it. there, there have been some messages given that almost make it sound like Jesus has sinned against her here. And he knew no sin. So that's not what's happening here. And we know Jesus is God. God is love. And love is patient and kind. And so I would just caution reading anything into this that says Jesus is being mean to her. Because I think he knows that she's about to pass the test that he has for her, for the benefit of the disciples in their life. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to bow down at the feet of anybody that I don't think can help me <laughs> with my problem. And so she's coming to him with, with a heart that sees you know, her desperate situation, sees her desperate condition. And she's saying, have mercy. Read verse 26 again. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And then in uh, Matthew's version, in so that happens in Matthew chapter 15, and in verse 22, she says, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon possessed. So she has some knowledge of Messiah. She calls him son of David. So she has you know, a, a working knowledge of the Jewish hope of a Messiah, someone to you know, be the king of kings. And so maybe she's heard that teaching. Maybe she's done traveling. Maybe she's gone to another town. But she has a working idea of who he is. And, and his response to her isn't, you know, give me a minute. I heard you. I'll be right with you. And, and she continues to beg. And even when Jesus was silent before her, she still pursued him. She still begged and begged in her desperation for her daughter. And she's begging the only one who can make a change, the only one who can help the You know, the... The religious leaders, they knew all the teachings about the Messiah and they rejected it. And, and their, the covenant blessings belong to them. But his silence doesn't mean he's unconcerned for her. And then verse 27, he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And so here the children is referring to Israel. 
in the dogs in in this day and time there were you know the more I can say wild dogs but the dogs that were outside the home more kind of maybe ravenous but there also were dogs that were invited into homes that um, were allowed to be in the home and eat of the crumbs that fell to the floor um, and so but still the reference of dogs as far as the the Jews were concerned, it was an insult. It was saying, you know, uh, that their state is lowly, that their condition is less than. And so she could have bucked up against him when he said, let the children be satisfied first. She could have given a foul response, or she could have said, um, you know, that's not fair, or, you know, why, why do you call me a dog? I'm so offended. You don't, you know, she could have gone any 20,000 ways. But her response is, yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. So she is saying, yes, Lord, and that later on in, in the section that I had, you know, Peter's, um, confession of Christ, he is saying, no, Lord, you know, when, when Jesus talks about, you know, that he will be, you know, despised, rejected, killed, um, rise again, Peter is saying, no, and he's trying to say, oh, no, 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 that's not the Savior you're going to be, but here she's saying, yes, Lord, and that she's satisfied, she's okay with whatever crumbs, whatever he will allow, whatever he will permit her to be able to, to claim. That she's, she's good with that. And she's fine with that. She will take it. And then in verse 29, she says, and he said to her, because of this, because of this answer, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. So simply by God's word, at a distance, her daughter is not there because it tells us that she goes uh, back to her home. So just at a distance, by God's word, the little girl is healed and made clean. And so that, that stands in contrast of she's willing to just have faith in his word alone, as it is, straight from him, you know, in contrast to the Pharisees who were just setting God's word aside and ignoring it. And Jesus says to her, a woman, great is your faith. And then that's, uh, you can read in Matthew's account is in chapter 15 verse 28 because in the mark account he says because of your answer go your daughter's made well but in matthew he says oh woman your faith is great it shall be done for you as you wish and her daughter was healed at once and from what i had looked at in, as far as studying and sources it's yeah. themes that Jesus only says, great is your faith to one other person. And that's the Roman centurion in Luke, who has the, the servant who's unwell. And so for us, I guess, as far as a, an application, first of all, understanding our own desperate need for him, which the, the account of the Pharisees and what they were doing, they, they did not get that. They do not grasp their desperate need for him. And for us to pursue Jesus, he knows we're there. <laughs> he knows us to the fullest extent, even when he seems silent. And, and risk. <clears throat> this woman risked ridicule. She risked being silenced by the disciples. And she risked overcoming ob obstacles to pursue him. You know, are, are we willing to do the same? Are we willing to um, 
pursue him when it's inconvenient or pursue him when it's tiresome or pursue him when it's, you know, vying for a position on, with the 20 other things that we have to accomplish or get to because he's the only real and lasting solution to our problems, to our circumstances. You know, and, in, and instead of our circumstances moving us to distrust or moving us to second guessing him, at least that would just be the challenge to myself and to each of you who in those times, let it move you to him and pursuing him. And there's no, no illusions about following Jew, Jesus, not including some type of suffering. You know, in his own obedience to God the Father, that involves suffering. But he surrendered to the Father's will. <clears throat> so the, the condition of heart is, is a major theme in this section. Just that know that being just kind of in the presence of Jesus, witnessing, witnessing these miracles, just being able to even be present there didn't equate to automatic faith. And I think our author in the book even said that in, in one lesson. It, it does take that kind of surrendering the heart, that yielding to him, that being willing to say, I've been a fool to think I have control over all of this, control over my own life, that you're not Lord just because I don't follow the Lord. Well, he is Lord of our life, and, you know, whether we claim him or not. And so I guess that's just um, what, I, what I took out of these um, texts, but there's so much more. It's such a rich area with all the things that happen with the bread. You know, this is kind of sandwiched <laughs> between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And in each of those instances, there, there was abundance. There was enough, and there was even more left. He is enough. So for any circumstance, for any need that we have, he is enough. Thank you, and we'll make sure you all have time for your small groups. Thank you. 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 Thank you.